So there is no question that the uh, Russian intelligence was operating in a very major way. And mind you, this is also a war zone where Russia's future is at stake. So they anticipated the coup? They anticipated the coup. They anticipated, not that, they I am very sure, 100% I can tell you, that he, the contacts that the Western intelligence established with this person was known to the Russians, Russian government authorities. They monitored it. Saturday the 24th of June was quite a dramatic day on the Russian front as they say. On that day, the Va chief of the Wagner militia, Yevgeny Prigozhin, suddenly said that he was launching what he called strangely a march for justice, but which was in reality an armed insurrection or a rebellion attempt, what, however you see it. And his forces advanced to some extent. There was of course a great amount of joy among Western commentators and experts, all of whom uh, suddenly decided that Russia was on the verge of crumbling, that Putin was fleeing the country even. But the whole affair ended quite tamely almost 12 hours hours later, there was a negotiation in which the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, was involved. Prigozhin basically left the country, his uh, operations ended, and all those predictions of the imminent collapse of Russia were proved completely wrong. So what exactly happened in Russia on that day and over the past couple of days? Uh, former Indian diplomat M.K. Bhadrakumar has been a, somebody who has been closely following the situation in Russia and has written some very keen analytical pieces explaining what happened in Russia as part of that coup. Thank you so much for joining, sir. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Yes, so I think for many viewers, the first question, I mean, let's, to look at the facts, basically, the first question really would be, what exactly was this 12-hour insurrection, so to speak, because when it uh, came up, when it began Friday night, Saturday morning, more or less, uh, you know, Prigozhin was like, he's going to march to Moscow. He had all these demands of the saying that the Russian defense officials should meet him. He spoke as though he had been massively discriminated against, you know, and that he was, you know, on this quest, crusade for justice. And then 12 hours later, everything kind of ended pretty tamely. So, uh, what exactly happened behind the scenes? What is the aspect we're really missing here? Because a lot of people were very confused. You see, the missing part is definitely that uh, uh, Prigozhin's uh, descent uh, incrementally, progressively transformed over time. And uh, that is, initially it began as a matter of uh, the shortage of munition out the Bak Bakhmut front for the fighters, the uh, incapacities of uh, or the inefficiency of the defense ministry and such aspects. Then it took on a form of uh, vitriolic attack right. on the top brass, hmm. but including the defense minister, who is of course a very close aide to Putin. So it just stopped short of Putin. And then <laughs> when the coup, it is a coup, I must have said, I should have said that in the beginning. There's no doubt about it. It was an attempted coup. Right. Uh, when it began, uh, as uh, he moved from the uh, camps in Lugansk, in Donetsk. Uh, now, that is also an interesting part because the man realized by that time that after the Bakhmut operation was over, uh, Moscow was uh, circumscribing him, right. containing him by removing him to an obscure spot, pitching tents and staying put there in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do. So at that time when he launched the operation, if you see the last statement that he made in, uh, statements or rather a number of videos that he made in, uh, on, on Friday, uh, there was very heavy political content. Hmm. And if you have been uh, any discerning observer uh, could have made out and any if you have been progressively following him, as I had been doing in terms of his uh, Telegram, uh, Twitter, and all kinds of stuff that he was, social media he was uh, taking to, there was a dramatic transformation of a political content was introduced into it. And when he ended there, he made outrageous uh, assessments like this entire operation was a contrived affair and Russia faces no threat from NATO or Ukraine. Now, this is exactly what you would have heard from Antony Blinken or somebody in Washington or uh, uh, in capitals such as London 
Paris and so on. So this means that, you know, that he had carried away from a, a, a dissenter in terms of his personal issues, Wagner's issues, corporate issues with the Russian Defense Ministry to an overt political stance of challenging. After all, when you say that the special military operation is all baloney, that it, there was no such, it was completely unwarranted. He is questioning actually the leadership at the highest level. Because if you remember, the operations began with a very major address to the nation by Putin, right. where he spelt out the factors under this. So he was no doubt taking on the regime, mm -hmm. to answer your question. It was uh, a, 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 a conception that, his conception was that uh, he moved out of the camps in Lugansk, headed for Rostov, where the headquarters of the Southern Military Command is located on the borders, close to the borders of uh, something like about just 200 kilometers from the war front in Ukraine mm -hmm. is Rostov. Now, uh, that is where the Russian commanders, including General Garasimov, uh, they used to visit there and used to operate from there in terms of you know monitoring the operations and so on. So I think uh, there was some kind of a feeling that he would be able to take as captives, hostages, the top brass of the Russian right. army because the operations of the Ukrainian offensive was going on and so on. But in the event, he found that except for the generals who were running the show there, there were none of those guys, big guys from, big fish from Moscow. Moscow. It, it's a place that even Shoigu used to. Hmm. So then <clears throat> he threatened that he took over. So there was no resistance there because it is an army command center, you know, and it is not a fortification or anything like that. So he came and encircled the place and took over. And then he said that when he found that there was nobody there, he said he was marching on to Moscow. So he started marching on with his tanks and armor and all that on the highway linking Moscow. Now that is a very hopeless endeavor. It's an, of course, it's an expressway, all right, but it's still 700 kilometers away you know, marching on Moscow like that. <clears throat> and some reports say that he was already approaching Moscow region hmm. when, you know, uh, the, the, the Russians, you know, didn't stop anything, didn't challenge or anything like that. So <sighs> the point is, it was a political move. The unknown factors here, which will come out definitely, is this, he was not a political animal of this kind previously. He was a money-making machine. Mm -hmm. He was an oligarch. Right. And he saw in the Wagner an organization which is not audited by the state with unlimited funding by the state and where he was the titular head by virtue of which he had access to enormous resources. Now the New York Times says on Saturday that uh, it, lately he had also been secretly siphoning off weaponry and so on and storing it, which means that somewhere along the line he started developing a political agenda. Right. Because uh, the point is his heroism at a personal level is not to be questioned because after all he was there in the front in Bakhmut and it was a very fierce battle which war of attrition, a decisive war of attrition. And uh, secondly, his uh, capacity to use the social media yeah, effectively. Very uh, effective communicator, effectively, yes. for good or for yes, better or for yes. worse. worse yes. I've seen actually in the whole hierarchy there, only Dmitry Medvedev coming close to this, <laughs> you know, in using the telegram channel, right. you know. Uh, but uh, uh, there, of course, poles apart. This man is really great in that. So it is 100% uh, sure that a oligarch of this kind would have escaped the attention of the Western intelligence. The man's personal wealth is estimated to be $1.2 billion. So they had their eyes on him for quite some time. That's Definitely, likely. because he is also reputed to be very influential in the corridors of power in uh, 
Kremlin mm. and some people have usually he's called Putin's chef mm. in the sense that he started in the catering business right. and he got massive lucrative contracts for catering to the Russian army, army right. and government departments and including the Kremlin. And uh, these things are conceivably possible only with some political support, mm. you know. So you see, he made his millions there. And uh, then Wagner is a different kettle of fish. So you see, then he graduated to that. So the uh, American side and the British side intelligence, you know, would definitely have been putting a mark on him, uh, would have put a mark on him long time ago, before the war began. And the problem generally with the oligarchs is that, uh, you know, there is an unwritten understanding from Putin yeah. That uh, they must, they can keep their loot. Right. He said this in a famous. Ha, you, you had written about it, Ambassador. But before we go to the oligarchs, I think one question I wanted to ask you yeah, yeah. is that the biggest, uh, I think the biggest thing everyone was talking about, speculating about, wondering about, was that uh, was this, you know, a blow or a humiliation for Putin, or was this something probably the Russians had anticipated? And I think that is what is really divided. Correct. An analyst, correct, correct, so correct, to speak. There's correct, a large correct, school who correct, says correct. this was a blow to Putin. Actually, but your view is different on this. Yes, actually, the thing is, there is no question that that place where Wagner is operating was crawling with the KGB. I'm using the KGB expression because you know it's very well known as an expression. It's called in a different FSB. Uh, if it's, F it's called FSB, mm -hmm. but the 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 their tentacles are there all over the place because the uh, Russian system works much the same way as Stalin worked in Stalingrad, which is this, you know, the generals fight, but the commissars are sitting there, mm. and the KGB is sitting there, monitoring the whole thing, and with independent communication to Moscow, and, you know, hand, from, from where the war is handled. And the generals don't fight wars. The wars are fought from Moscow, right. you know. So you see, basically, that culture is still there in the, in the Russian system. After the dismemberment, uh, dismemberment of the Soviet Union, so there is no question that the uh, Russian intelligence was operating in a very major way. And mind you, this is also a war zone where Russia's future is at stake. Right. So they anticipated the coup. They anticipated the coup. They anticipated not that. They I am very sure, hundred percent, I can tell you that he, the. Contacts that the Western intelligence established with this person was known to the Russians, right. Russian government authorities. Mm -hmm. They monitored it. Now the big question, why didn't they act? I heard some reports, discussions yesterday saying that the Russians, the, the, the Kremlin messed up because, you know, they should have acted faster and all that. You see, the point is they are in the middle of a war. And at that time, uh, an action which uh, is uh, smacking of disunity at home is not the good thing to project to the enemy. Right. And this is a very grim existential struggle that the country is fighting. So, and Putin is in his, if you followed him all through, you know that he's a man of infinite patience. Mm. He never acts rashly. And only with calculation he acts. So, and he knows also the ins and outs of the working of the intelligence system. So, obviously a decision was taken to give this man a long rope. But concentrating on finishing of that Bakhmut operation, because there is a very major uh, stepping up due in terms of a proper Russian offensive, which not many people do not understand is, up until now, the war has been fought by the militia groups. Mm. But the regular Russian army, military, is just moving in now only. So their military apparatus was not there. They were firing artilleries and uh, lobbing bombs and you know missiles and so on. But the foot soldiers were the militia. So you see, they were preparing for a very major offensive now because the Russians have concluded that uh, a military solution is all that is possible and only with the complete eviction of the United States and NATO from the face of Ukraine can this problem be sorted out. Right. A half a house is not possible. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to be bogged down in a quackmare fighting the Russians like the Americans like this in a proxy war. Mm -hmm. So you see the agenda, why I'm saying all this very in a nutshell, the agenda is very profound. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want a distraction there. Yeah. 
So they let go and they were fair. I'm very sure that uh, when I said Putin knows the working of the intelligence organizations and all very well, he was one of them. It's because, you know, that he knew that at any time, if the crunch time comes, they can act and just squash this guy. Right. But uh, why waste it and why create a ruckus? And why create confusion domestically? You know, the, what is not outside, outsiders don't realize is that there is a very vibrant opinion making inside Russia also. Mm -hmm. If you see the social media, telegram channels, for instance, you will not imagine the amount of you know nonsense which is appearing there, critical of the Russian government, which is almost, you know, which even you know, Western correspondents sometimes quote from them to make their point. Right. So you see, the thing is, there is a domestic opinion problem also for them to handle. So they let it run, but supremely confident that they could fine tune it at its time and if a crunch time comes, they could act. They let it go like that. But when I think this, uh, they think progressively developed, this guy developedly, progressively developed a political agenda, hmm. the complexion changed. Right. Because this is when that uh, I mentioned to you the uh, Putin's uh, way of handling the oligarchs. oligarchs. Yes, actually I wanted to ask you more yeah. about that because uh, it's interesting you brought in uh, that aspect. There's been a lot of discussion about oligarchs mm -hmm. uh, after the war started, but even before, how mm. at one level they are seen as uh, a key part of Russia's current developmental model, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. They are very much there, you can't ignore them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is also the feeling that they are widely disliked mm -hmm. and they are seen as paragons of corruption mm -hmm. in, uh, in a sense. Absolutely. So how, is, you know, how do you place Prigozhin in this uh, group of oligarchs, so to speak, as in what role did the oligarchs play and how do you see Prigozhin's rise in the context of that? You know, uh, Putin watched the Elsin years largely from St. Petersburg in the initial years. Then uh, he was brought over to Russia, over to Moscow as the KGB chief and then the uh, aide to Yeltsin and so on. So he saw from very close quarters what was going on there at that time. And uh, it, it comes as no surprise for anyone. He was a cardholder of the Communist Party. He was a senior KGB official and all that, uh, it, it doesn't need much uh, you know, guesswork to imagine the sense of revulsion right. within the security establishment of Russia that the country had come to this pass. The decadence. Decadence. The decadence. Sense, yeah. decadence. Even Primakov mm. was, you know, they, were, they were completely uh, felt disgusted mm. that the state was being stripped so clean mm. and these guys were living in the fat of the land mm. and having such a lifestyle and openly consorting with the Western power countries right. to transfer wealth out of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, this is it. So, uh, but he couldn't do anything because he was put in Elson's appointee. When 2000 election, he won on his own, a mandate of his own, on steam, without any help from Elson. Putin was a different man. He, he knew then that he, the time was available for him to push his agenda. Right. So in 2000, year 2000, in the summer of 2000, he took a meeting of these top 21 people. I've read various uh, accounts of it, and I mean, Kremlin had never seen such limousines moving into this one, and these guys coming out with their private armies and all that, you know, these oligarchs, that's what they were used to. They were calling the shots in the bulls, uh, in the Elsini years. Right. They had private armies, mm -hmm. you know. They could commit murders. They could do anything they liked. And these are all people without any erudition, and uh, who came from a very sleazy background. By the way, Peroshin is also was a convict in the Soviet era. Hmm. He, was, he, he, he was jailed actually, you know. So this is the type of fellows who, who made rich by cutting corners and committing murders and so on. Right. So 21 of them came and then a close to session, he had a face-to-face -face interaction with them. Accounts have inevitably filtered later of what Putin said. So in some and substance, the message is this, that, you know, that look, if you look into the mirror, you don't look a very elegant people as you think you are. But then if you put the state of the country at that time, that also doesn't give a very elegant picture. Now let's come realize this. Message is simply this, that I am in charge. Hmm. And whatever you might have done in the Yeltsin years, it will not go on for long. I will want you to stop it now. But 
in the uh, interests of the free market economy and its compulsions that have arisen in the country, you can keep your businesses. And since you have this money and you, you are spending it on this kind of thing like private jets and yachts and all this kind of luxurious things or your children studying abroad and uh, holidaying and all this kind of thing, I won't do anything of that kind. That is, you have, whatever has happened, has happened. I am willing to live with that. But, and you are doing now also some of your very enterprising businesses, which the country needs and the economy needs. But on the other hand, like you did in the past, do not interfere with the internal politics. Do not subvert Russia's governance. And like in the Elsini years, you know, they subverted even democracy. Right. Elections couldn't be held freely. Zhuganov, the Communist Party head, should have won, should have won in, in 1996, 1996 <clears throat> if it were a free election. That right. was Russia's history. Yeah. But these guys made it sure that Zhuganov lost yeah. final round. And he was towering so far ahead With of generous Yeltsin. help from the Americans. Huh. American uh, think tanks and everyone got into the act to see that Shuganov didn't make it because, you see, they would have had not, uh, they would have been helpless mm. if through a democratic mandate of the West European type, if a communist party had come back to power within five years of the disbandment of the Soviet Union. Right. It would have given such a big message to a time when there was so much of triumphalism that communism was dead and communism has been buried. Mm. You know, this is the situation at that time. So you see, the, uh, that is all the work of these uh, oligarchs. So Putin's message was this. And then, you know, he, uh, so he told them that you can keep this, but don't mess around with this. Those who didn't take it seriously had to pay a very heavy price. Simply put, they had to leave Russia. They had to leave Russia. And uh, Khodorkovsky, who's living in America now, was rated as the sixth richest man in the world uh, with at that time. Right. And he lives in exile in America. Oh. He didn't kill them. Oh. He just told them, just get lost. Right. That is what it And then their assets, their businesses were appropriated. Energy, Khodorkovsky's was the energy company, was nationalized and they went on, life moved on. So you see, this process also the same thing is, uh, the, uh, what I see is uh, actually Putin has not changed one inch from his previous thing. This is not a personal vendetta for him. His, he sees his mission as something where he has been vested with the power to protect the Russian state from these predatory elements. You see, this is quintessentially the thing. Look at the deal that they have struck. Right. I don't know if you look at its elements, one principal element is that this man has been told to get lost. Of course, he's not been allowed to fly away to the West. He's being taken under custody to Minsk, where Lukashenko will keep a very sharp eye on him right. for, for the rest of his life if he continues to live there. But if at some time, I'm very sure, if he just wants to go and live in Switzerland or somewhere, Putin will not mind. And then he has been segregated from the Wagner, Wagner group. Right. <clears throat> this is something, uh, Prasant, you know, we need to analyze also where they went wrong. And then where the Russians went Prasant, wrong. Uh, the Wagners. Ah, Wagner, okay. Now, you see, that is also a story by itself. Wagner is, because you know, the Soviet time, they were patronizing this national liberation mm. movements, and that was a very big instrument of Russian foreign policy. Right. And it helped the Soviets expand their influence globally. We know that. I don't need to dilate on that. But after that, they were no longer in a position to bankroll the, uh, such movements. The ideology had retreated from the Soviet system. And the main mission was one of survival and preserving the national interests. But the point is the interest still continued. And the Yugoslavia was the best example, mm. that their incapacity to intervene cost them heavily to go to the aid of a, the second biggest Slavic, Slavic nation country. in the world <coughs> after Russia was Yugoslavia. And it was just dismembered in their presence. Mm. They couldn't do a thing about it. This, and this took place when Putin was just taking over. All this would have you know, really worked on their psyche because they decided that they must also have 
an instrument to exercise power abroad, which is cost effective, just like the Americans have, the French have, and all the black water, oh. and all this kind of thing uh, have, but without the American agenda of bringing about regime changes. That is to say, they will deal with whichever established government is in power. They will not subvert it. Their dealings will be with the government, and through the government, they will operate in that country. If the government invites them, they will operate in that country. And other than that, they will not pursue your agenda. That is Wagner's agenda. Wagner's agenda. And this was, uh, I think, the key point you also made in the article was that this was not Prigozhin's agenda. This was the Russian state agenda. State agenda. Yes. And also another thing is, uh, uh, mind you, a technical detail, this Wagner group is a progeny of the Russian security military establishment. Right. That's very important because I think it's very important. people attribute it just to Prigozhin and it's say not it's It's not mercenaries. Huh. It's an organization created by the state hmm. as a long arm hmm. to operate in faraway countries cost effectively in a self-accounting manner to further the Russian national interests without getting into any ulterior agenda of its own like killing political leaders, overthrowing existing regimes, taking part in factional strife or anything of that kind. You know, this is what Wagner is. But then the point is, the state at the same time wanted, didn't want to be upfront. Hmm. So what they did is, they did a, what they thought was a smart thing, which is boomerang, which is to bring in a non-military figure in right. the front. And that's how this man came to be called the founder of Wagner. He was not a founder. He's not a military genius, nothing. And then he put on his <laughs> fatigues and considered himself to be a marshal of the army. Yeah. And he uh, started, you know, challenging the top brass sitting in uh, Moscow. So you see, this is what has happened. And now in the deal that uh, I, I, today I wrote, in fact, there are five elements there. And one of the elef elements is this, that, you know, that they, it clearly makes out that they don't want to disband the Wagner like that because the Wagner has a mission and it still is in the interest of the state, but it's running, it is gone, it is run amok. Right. Now, therefore, they will now bring it under the control of the defense ministry with accountability, and it will be run by professional, I'm sure, soldiers, generals, colonels, brigadiers, and so on. That I, I am just conjecturing. Yeah. But uh, it is being integrated into this, and the same thing they are doing also to the Chechen militia hmm. is also being integrated Kazanovs, now, yeah. which means, you know, that they will be drawing salaries, these fighters, they don't have to plunder the land for their livelihood, uh, where their families will be taken care of, the social welfare schemes which are lavishly available for the Russian soldiers, they will also be entitled to get, they will get lifelong pension, Medicare, blah, blah, everything, you know. So this is what they are doing with the Wagner, and they have drawn satisfaction that, uh, the bulk of the Wagner was unaffected by this call for mutiny. And that is actually what uh, also finally ended this, uh, how the coup ended. The man had, you know, just a stragglers, a few foot soldiers with him. And he knew that you can't take on Moscow with, with this kind of support. And he turned back from there. Absolutely. So I think all in all, the evaluation pretty much is that uh, th this was in some sense a very classic a fall of an oligarch uh, in what has what has happened in Russian history in recent times. It is no different in some ways from uh, many of the histories of other oligarchs. Only thing, of course, it is happening in the midst of a war. Do you see this in any way affecting the progress of uh, you know of, of of the situation, the war situation with the Ukrainian counteroffensive? Uh, not or, not at all. Not right. at all. That is that must be made very clear that you know that look. First of all. Uh, you can see it very much in front of you that the whole country rallied behind Putin. Yeah. We have bureaucracy, the civic society, and you know even the opposition, like Gennady uh, uh, Zhuganov, the uh, Communist Party leader, he gave a thumping. What is? I mean, it it opens as a stirring statement, you mm. know, saying that whatever might be our differences with Putin, this is the this, Putin. He didn't mention, but with the with the regime. Uh, this is a time that we cannot afford it because the stakes are high. And he said external forces and their fifth column mm. in our country, mm. they still continue to operate. Mm. This is what it shows. He was the first leader, in fact. Zhuganov is the first leader to mention about 
Western powers and right. their fifth columns mm -hmm. in, in, in Russia, you know. So you see, Putin has uh, one, uh, this, as a result of it, the effective way that he handled it, ensuring that there is absolutely no bloodshed in this matter. It would have been spun out of control if they were yes, street fighting and all that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. uh, I think he, has, uh, he is now in an unassailable position and the Americans will have to learn to live with him now for a long time. And much after Biden has gone, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to live with him. That is the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, uh, a little known thing is that uh, I wrote in today's uh, piece, I quoted that, you know, that on the 22nd, that is um, two days before the, uh, the coup, uh, or the evening, the, the day before the coup, Thursday, the Russian Security Council met. Now, this Russian Security Council is actually speaking the Soviet Communist Party's Politburo. Right. You know, that is effectively, that is how its functioning is. And it was a full quorum meeting, and that's, which means a message had gone out from the Kremlin that there is of something of extreme importance is going to be, sensitivity is mm -hmm. going to be discussed, and everybody, Lavrov, uh, Patrushev, right. Medvedev, right. everybody, Volodin, everybody was there at that time for this meeting. Mm -hmm. And that meeting, Gives, you must read that, you know, that, uh, that, one, that meeting gives you a flavor of the Russian mood today. You know, they have concluded, as I said earlier, that the Americans have to be taught a lesson. And their, uh, their hegemony can be stopped only if they are humiliated left, right, center. On the battlefield. On the battlefield. Right. So uh, your question is answered there. There is no way that the Russian operations will be allowed to be affected by this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for giving us, I think, what is a very unique perspective because a lot of reporting like we both have been reading has been completely colored by how the West and Western sources are very wishfully, I think, interpreting very wishfully. Uh, this yes. situation. Quite the true. number of analysts who were like, Putin has fled the country. <laughs> it's quite bizarre. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And that is all we have time for today. We'll be covering further issues on the Russia-Ukraine war, of course, also developments across the world on People's Dispatch and News Click. Do visit our websites, follow us on all our social media platforms and keep watching.